Got Hello. it. Hello, Nicholas Farelli. Mm. Welcome Hello. to 10.6 Life Factor. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Great. So we're here to talk about the library systems, a, a topic that may be a little dry for some people. You know, it's all in books, right? Not chocolate. That's it. It's done by design. Yeah, it's dry <laughs> by design. Right. And so um, I'm very interested in that topic. You know, the population that I serve, children, youth, and um, our recent contact at the library um, kind of brought up some questions like, where are the children? Why, you know, the library is not that busy or where are college students, where are they? So if you could introduce yourself at first um, with our audience so we can get an understanding of your background and why library systems or the topic of library is of interest in your area of expertise. Oh, sure. So I'm Nick Ferrelli. I am currently the instruction and outreach librarian for Taylor Memorial Library at Centenary University in Hackettstown, New Jersey. I have been working in libraries approximately almost 20 years, I would say, maybe 18 years. I started in 2006 at working at my alma mater's library, um, Adelphi University in Garden City. Mm -hmm. And during that time, I love telling the story. So at the time I graduated in 2004, I started working for the library in 2006. And when I graduated in 2004, I was planning on becoming a social studies teacher, secondary education. And towards the end of my undergraduate career, maybe year three, definitely year four, I discovered that I couldn't stand it. I, I did not have good experiences, I would say. I mean, I had good experiences in the classroom, but in terms of you know, classrooms and having 30 different students in a classroom and eight different sections of a class. It's, it was a lot. And trying to motivate those individuals, all 30 of them times eight uh, a day uh, became very cumbersome and difficult. And not all of them were always excited about history or writing or reading like I was. Mm -hmm. so when I started working for the library, not sure what I was going to do after that, I picked up a job in a library. I was always there. Um, I enjoyed the atmosphere, and I started working there, and then something beautiful happened, whereas those individuals who utilize the library are there for a specific reason. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we're talking academically speaking, uh, they're there because they want an atmosphere to study. They want the opportunity to discover information. They want the opportunity to interact with information professionals who can get them the materials that they need in order to succeed. Mm -hmm. So when I started discovering that, it was a vast difference, right, between going from trying to motivate a whole year's worth of students to learn and be active every day versus having those individuals come to me when they recognize that they need help and then they're asking for it. So it's a very different dynamic when you get into to libraries, especially in terms of information literacy and the request and need for help. And it's a higher degree of self-efficacy among those students who are requesting help. And it's not a difficult, it's not a, um, it's not an easy thing to do. Like, one of the hardest things to do in life or in general is to ask for help sometimes. And libraries provide that opportunity to do that academically and socially, no matter if it's a public library or an academic one. So, so shortly thereafter, I just fell in love with it. And my boss said, get an MLS. My friend was getting one at the time and I just went for it. And, that, and actually that was gonna be my next question. Um, with your secondary um, degree, you know, to, to teach a teacher's education, to teach um, at that level, then you'd have to go back to school to get the, the master's right. in science, I, I can imagine. Um, how many right. years that um, took for you? So I do a lot of programming with public libraries, also specifically about preparing for college. Mm -hmm. Um, college uh, is not necessarily for everybody. And there's a big push now to, to kind of go to trade schools. And I understand that college is very expensive, but there's also opportunity to pay for it as well. 
But I do think that it's extremely important to get a college degree if you can. So even if you start working in the field and decide that you want to go to college, get the two-year degree and then build on that. And, and that's one of the things, you know, when I started my my first master's program in library science, uh, you can do those things without breaking the bank. Uh, you, you can do it at a reduced pace. You can take one class a semester while you're working. Uh, those are, are, are you know, better aspects to doing it that way than taking out these tremendous loans and hoping you'll get a job that will enable you to pay them back, which is kind of the situation that we're in right now. So th that's and that's an, a good point. Do you find then, you know, during your time, you probably have a whole class of students fully, you know, ready going into library science. Have you seen a shift since you got you obtained your degree uh, as to the number of students who are in the program and where are they being sent? Especially in a library science program? Yes. So there, there's a little bit of an interesting dynamic going on here. So, so the onus of you wanting to start a library science program, and this is a very important thing that I would not only say is for library science, but any field that you are thinking that you want to work in mm -hmm. is to check out the Bureau of Labor Statistics website, which is bls.gov. Right. And they'll provide data for you that will tell you what specific jobs are going to be needed in the future. They'll tell you what those jobs are paying, the median average based on location. Those are all important things to look at. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about, I want to go to school for this, well, there's not going to be many colleges that are going to decline you. They're simply providing the education for you. So, You're the one that has to go out after that and find the job. So, so if let, there's let me say this though, I, I, I know we're, I'm, I may interrupt a time just to that's okay. come to a point. So, but is it that that's maybe not necessarily be fair for students? No, the it's not. Colleges should be um, the same way that you're saying students should go check out um, the Bureau um, of Labor's, um, you know, data bank or database about mm -hmm. job prospects. The college should be doing that as well and decide if they would want to encourage a student to take a certain program, knowing how the market is going to fare, especially with library. We, we, we are recognizing that the library is on its way out. Would you agree with that? Oh, thing? I wouldn't say that. No, it's <laughs> changing for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not on its way out. Und uh, underfunded, a lot of them, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but there are nonprofits, just like any other nonprofits that are struggling to maintain their, not their status quo, I wouldn't say. They're, tr they're struggling to main, uh, provide a sense of relevancy Mm -hmm. uh, which libraries do very well, but th it's a question of funding. How much are you willing to fund these institutions and how, you know all these data, all this data that we look at um, are basically being used to determine what those fund that what that funding is going to look like. So if there are more people participating in these programs, it's evidence-based practice to go to, um, a town director or in, in higher education to go to the, your higher administration and say, look, these are the services that we offer. It's increased mm -hmm. X amount over X, over X years, and we need more help. Whether or not we're going, you're, you'll get that help is one thing, but other people need to see value in it and participate in it. So if you're a member of the community and going to library programs mm -hmm. and getting value of it, say that. Say that to your to that library director. Say that to um, constituents or people who represent constituents in that town. Say so, those things. So, so the fact that okay, so your work your work is within usually educational institutions mm -hmm. where the library is embedded in those institutions. So, um, as you Correct. mentioned, that students who are motivated to come and seek out your services. Right. I mean, that's what kind of generate the excitement around around the job versus you being in the classroom where you have to motivate students in, in, in the other. Right. So, right. So the, the question here is. Community libraries, of course, are going to be different. 
from that of the a, a college library a library in a college setting in the the fact that one library in the college setting may not necessarily be open to the public the community libraries are and if we're finding that and and there are data to support some of that that libraries are sitting empty then how is it we, we cannot agree with the statement that libraries are going are on its way out because those people are the same people are attending public library programs. So I'll put it in a little bit of perspective here. So mm -hmm. I teach and let's say I've taught overall 800 or 900 students in one semester. I'm not reaching all of those students in the classroom at, at the same time. It, it's just a matter of fact. Um, at any given moment, I, I believe, I wish I had the number on hand, at about 30% of students are actively engaged and paying attention at any given moment. Otherwise, they're staring at the pretty boy or girl across. They're thinking about what they're going to eat later. But so if I get those interactions in the classroom so that they know who I am and what I look like, mm -hmm. so that they know where to go when they need help is the most important thing to me in those in those information literacy classes. Excuse me, but you have the same thing in public libraries. You will see whole groups of people who will show up to any event that a public library offers. They're the same types of people. So if I'm only getting, let's say I'm getting, I'm going to put this high, I'll, I'll, let's say 50% of my students will then come to the library and participate in educational workshops or information literacy classes. Mm -hmm. or extracurricular events that we do. We're not always just academic. We're also a safe space for people to come and meet and talk with each other and have shared experiences. Those people are looking for the same, the, the public is looking for the same thing. Mm -hmm. So those people do show up to those library programs and there's different aspects of it also. So maybe there's a very niche program that not many people would be interested in, in going to. It's happened to me sometimes when I would do programs for libraries and, you know, one person shows up and you look at it in a kind of a perspective as that I don't need to fill the room for it to be a success at the same time. If one, if three people show up to a workshop, if 15 people registered for a workshop that I'm doing at a public library and three of them wind up showing up, I got to help three people that I normally wouldn't have been able to reach which is valuable. The other thing is these programs are generally free. So people will just sign up to them and then not show up because there's nothing to lose on their end and vice versa. You'll get no signups and then the room is filled. You have no idea sometimes what you're going to get. But you're saying that library is a nonprofit, but majority of libraries, especially of, uh, well, community libraries are funded by um, state and, 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 and federal mm -hmm. dollars. Um, the college libraries are funded by, you know, students, um, certain fees and, and tuition based, certain, yeah, and, and other, um, donations that may come. It's not so much where you're going out to do fundraising. Are there library found, um, foundations really that engage in large, you know, fundraising events to bring in funds for the to, to sure. If you're looking at local libraries, public libraries, almost everyone will have a, a a separate nonprofit attached to them called Friends of the of the Library okay. of a specific library, where they go out and they have fundraisers and engage the public to get um, additional funding for libraries for specific things that that library is looking for. So I'm currently a friend of the Hackettstown public, uh, free public library. And we will do, you know, the traditional things, bake sales and, and other things like that and engage businesses and other entities in the Hackettstown area to get participation. Libraries aren't just a place to go to sit, relax, read a book, they're community spaces. Mm -hmm. They're places for you to meet other members in, of your community and learn about what's going on in your community. So they're, they're multifaceted. So you get organizations that will help. Um, and academic libraries, not so much, but there are other methods to fundraise for them. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them, you get a bunch through the American Library Association. 
Uh, you'll get uh, partnerships for unwanted material or material that has exhausted its usefulness in the library. There are organizations that will buy that material from libraries and then sell them on your behalf. Or if they can't be sold, they will they will then in turn create libraries in underpoverished counties or nations. Mm -hmm. So you're you're building additional community hubs through the, you're working with those organizations. Wait a minute. Are you saying that a set of knowledge that maybe become redundant or outdated mm -hmm. send it to a developing country for them to use that information? Sometimes it depends on the material. So like if we're talking about medical material. So from an academic library standpoint, mm -hmm. uh, generally the rule of thumb is nothing older than five years. Okay. Um, there are some historical medical documents that can be used for research if you're talking about a history of a particular thing that mm -hmm. is still valuable, but maybe you say you have an updated copy that will have a little bit more information in it. So if that copy that I that we are choosing to get rid of was published in 19 or say 2010, and now we have a 2023 copy with more information in it, mm -hmm. then we're going to retain that copy versus holding on to the older one. That information in the older copy, it doesn't mean that it's that it's not valuable anymore. There's just a more complete version. So those kinds of things will go to building libraries in um, areas that that need them. Okay. Uh, that kind of information is still valuable. Uh, but I, you know, we're not donating old medical books that are, you know, suggesting, you know, that you drill a hole in someone's head to relieve <laughs> headaches or something like that. Right. Like, you know, we're not doing that. Okay. So with the you know, you know, you 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 kind of push back on the question of um, library going, you know, going through or going uh, on its way out. So, how is technology then this improved um, way of getting information? In, in terms of getting information or using technology? Well, both getting okay. using, accessing, you know, um, information. How <clears throat> How has the library then modernized its system from what you've come across to, to kind of meet the Gen Z population, for example? So there's a couple, there's two different things. So one, you you're talking about access to technology. Right. Um, to the technology itself. So not everyone can afford the newest MacBook or Adobe Photoshop or other expensive software or programs, things like that. If the libraries can can provide those licenses and training on that, then that's an avenue, an opportunity for those who don't have access to those things um, to get experience in using them. And we saw that big time during COVID where there was a huge um, disparity called you know, a, a digital divide right. where there are students who have access to technology and those who don't, mm -hmm. and you you will see a much larger success rate among those students who have simply have the access to the technology, and that doesn't even that doesn't even exclude it to just hardware and software. It, it could just be Wi-Fi. We saw libraries, especially public libraries, during COVID, students who did not have access to Wi-Fi. We saw libraries put up extra hotspots around their building. Mm -hmm. So that parents could take their students and they can sit in the parking lot to get Wi-Fi. And those are people who don't have access to the Internet, which is absolutely necessary to succeed in the classroom. Um, if you're talking about indexing and discovery of information, there are really myriad of ways that libraries are working together to provide the most access to individuals. One of those ways is working through consortia. So libraries banding together and saying, hey, we need access to this ebook collection and my small library can't afford this, but there's a need for my population to get access to it. Mm -hmm. They're banding together and they're forming contracts with larger corporations saying we each put in a little bit of money and this is what we want access to. 
So mm -hmm. that kind of funding is shared between multiple libraries to provide greater access to more material, including ebooks, scholarly research, uh, leisurely reading, as well as uh, professional or trade readings, uh, things like that. And the state does provide uh, a considerable amount of aid to libraries for access to those resources. That's very interesting. Yeah. So, so then uh, the question of um, competing with um, other digital platforms mm -hmm. you know, that may or may, may not necessarily be as authentic as, you know, the services and the, the type of information, yeah, knowledge that um, information that the library um, maintain that is part of the, the 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 process of kind of meeting the demands then of of this technology yeah it, it's meeting the demands it's also respecting the the integrity of individual and collective collections mm -hmm. so language when you search in libraries is different from the language that we use when we search in google yes. there's a huge disparity between the two so when you're looking things up in Google or Bing or whatever search engine, DuckDuckGo, whatever you're using, mm -hmm. um, there are algorithms involved. So we progressed as a society with technology from Web 1.0, where uh, you or I would log on to a computer. We would go to a dictionary to get, or an encyclopedia to get information. Right. We would log off. Then we changed to Web 2.0, wikis, blogs, podcasts, things like that. I log on, I share information, I interact with other people, and then I log off. Mm -hmm. We're in the current situation of the internet as a commodity where it's not about what you're looking at. It's about keeping you online as long as possible. So interacting with news okay. stories, interacting mm -hmm. with videos, you'll see that in things. Uh, I tell my a, a few years ago, the streaming platform Twitch offered mm -hmm. what's called channel points. So the longer that you watch a stream, you can hit a button every time it pops up to get channel points that you can redeem for other things. Mm -hmm. There are ways to keep you engaged online. It doesn't, they don't really care what you're engaged with. Or if the information is possibly. bad. Exactly. <laughs> it, they, they, they just want you online. Right. And when you search for things using Google or any search engine, mm -hmm. you are it's the, the results of that search are designed with your personal algorithm in mind. So it's not when you type anything into Google, it's not taking into consideration what you are typing in that moment. It's taking into consideration, yes, what you're typing in that moment, but all the recent searches and long history searches that you've done before, which are specifically designed to mm -hmm. get your interest in those things and make those comparisons so that it will effectively keep you online longer. Doesn't necessarily mean that the information you're looking for is going to come up on the first page. And one of the things I'll tell my students too is when you're searching in Google, search your name and something about yourself. Yeah. And then search your name and something about yourself, but put quotation marks around your name and then see what comes up, what hierarchy of those things come up. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the difference between searching in Google and searching in a library database. Mm -hmm. Library databases don't care about, they're not tracking your information um, for any one user. When we go in and we look at statistics, we're seeing what phrases, what terms are being searched so we can kind of manipulate our website and individual guides to put those things out there. So if you're searching for um, myocardic infractions or heart attacks, mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of nursing students, then maybe I need to make a guide about that and how to search to get to that material you know, quickly. But it's not storing that information. And it's not storing that specific information about any one individual. So you have to be extremely precise in the way that you search library databases to get the most relevant material back for you. Let's ask this question then. Okay. If if we if it if it seems just by your explanation that searching on a library database is safer, it's more accurate, it gives you more legitimate information versus the other Google um, Bing 
mm -hmm. Wikipedia and all those um, Duck, Duck Go and all those other um, Google search um, search engines. Yeah. Then why is it that everybody else, it seems, tend to go with the latter, which is because it's free and it's popular. So uh, it's saying there's a paywall to get into some of these library databases because I, I thought. Um, for example, Pearson or some of those other yeah. um, uh, Psych Index, EBSCO, Academic Search Premier, they're actually going off by clicks. They're doing what the same do? thing. They're doing the same thing that Google does, where you click on an, on an article, it creates, it makes their... Um, each item or each sort of item become more popular and actually push it sure. to the top. Thus, sure. thus, they are actually, you know, I, I was at a at a meeting recently and it was um, reported that you cannot, you can, uh, um, professors or teachers or whomever is using library databases should not download an article and send it to students. You should send the student directly to the library database, yes. because if, for example, Pearson recognized that, wait a minute, nobody's clicking on this article except one person that downloaded in this institution. We are yes. not getting that, that that popularity type. There's a term for it, and I'm sure you can fill that in. Uh, Have you heard that? Yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. So that that's <laughs> a little bit of the ambiguity that surrounds it. It's much easier, say, if you are teaching a course and you need an article and we find it and I give it to you for you, for you to then share that article in your learning management system to your right. class, which is your, your re so say you have 15 students in that class. Well, 15, that would have equated to 15 clicks or page views, exactly. as we used to call them. Um those you, you don't see that you'll see that at different institutions what most institutions will do now in the in a classroom is they will link to the article through the library's database so you're still getting um those clicks and those views uh, mm -hmm. measurable outcomes for what is meaningful right that's the way it should be done because there's value in that so let let's say you and I wrote an article together and we got accolades for it Mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a it's th those clicks those downloads contribute to what's called an impact factor so if our article is that fantastic it, it's going to have a high impact value if people are clicking on it and downloading it and using it in their research or, or, or and publishing that research it gets pushed up the list and we get a higher profile out of that you don't want to take that away from people but, but it still then compete with the um tracking in a way it may not necessarily be tracking someone's um ip address or possibly no code. no it's not doing that you know, no but it, it is still keeping track because you may go and say how many times the article was downloaded how mm -hmm. many times it was clicked on how many times it was referenced how many you know of the keywords that were used yes for that yeah. particular article are they tracking it in that way as well uh, libraries do, for sure, and I'm guarantee you that that databases and journal titles are doing the same. the The other interesting part here too is that if you're saying a specific journal or a specific article, those articles are contained in the journal, and that journal is sold as part of a package. So you're not looking at just one specific article; you're looking at one article within a group of journals that could be anywhere from hundreds to tens mm -hmm. of thousands of different journals that are housed within a database is which what you are subscribing to. Mm -hmm. um, most of the times those things are sold to libraries as a database package with um, minimal opportunity to swap individual journal titles. So those that's why those clicks are important because right. if I am looking at renewing a individual title or swapping it out for a new one i don't want to get rid of a particular journal if it's being heavily used i want to retain so, that so a, a, a an educational institution for you know may lose a particular journal 
data sure. bank because of that reason. It's the, not being yeah, used. It's not or being used. It's being provided instead of linked in a learning exactly and then they will come up with something like well um at first it was you can't download it and give it to students because oh copyright issues and this and all that kind of stuff but now they turn to another thing because of the whole digital um tracking Um, yeah and and these libraries know that and publishers know that too so the mm -hmm. way i treat those kind of statistics is you can't treat them as as one off. This year we had X amount. You have to look at the trend of, of a few years mm-hmm. and seeing really how how much use that database or that journal title is getting. Okay. That's going to ultimately make the decision whether or not you want to retain it. Along with other things, is it necessary to retain for accreditation purposes? You you may you may yeah. have low use, but you need to have it. You need to have it. But, um, you know, well said. So let, let's let's look at this question. Do you have historical archives in your library? I, I don't know if that's the correct way of saying it, but for example, do you still have, you know, VHS holdings, DVDs? Yes. So <laughs> we're we're have seeing you checked out. <laughs> we're so my current library does not have things like VHS tapes or microfilm or microforms. Right. At my current, my previous institution, we were just starting to get rid of those things. But there's different things that are involved in that. So not everything that is online, or not everything that is in print, is in, is available online. Right. And those differences. So one of one of the examples when I was going through microforms at my previous job, um, I had found the FBI. Um, profiling tapes for Fred Hampton. And I thought, this is interesting. I'd like to take a look at that. And I I, want, I didn't get a chance, but I wound up to wound up retaining them because what information online can be changed. We see that with Wikipedia almost okay. every day. Exactly. Um, that microform as it existed is not changing. That information is staying there. So the FBI, and I'm not making this a, a grand conspiracy theory just in this this case, but if the FBI transfer that to, to online and anyone can view it, they have the ability to black out or, or, or delete whatever they want before publishing it. Mm-hmm. Wikipedia is a fantastic example of that. I don't I'm not a librarian who's going to tell my students don't use Wikipedia. Use Wikipedia as a discovery tool. If you are thinking about or you see um, uh, a cardinal and you've never seen a cardinal before, Wikipedia Mm -hmm. is a great place to get information about the bird because you're going to have somebody who's obsessed with birds or obsessed with cardinals, Mm -hmm. and they're going to have that knowledge base and share it with sources. Mm -hmm. Where you get in trouble with Wikipedia are instances where we've seen – such as the Eric Garner case in New York City, where mm-hmm. they found that the NYPD was editing the Wikipedia change to change the narrative surrounding Eric Garner's death. Exactly. That's problematic, which is why you can't rely on Wikipedia. You have to verify those sources in different places. Um, but, if, but, 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 but some library database and you can correct this when you search may yield some results from wikipedia sometimes yes you have to limit your that's searches problem, that's problematic uh, i i don't see too much of that on the academic end but you there so we there is an academic or there is a a, a library replacement for google Mm-hmm. So that would be things where you're searching the entirety of the collection and other sources that have been vetted or supposed to be vetted. Um, not all of those resources are going to be scholarly. In fact, a vast majority of them aren't going to be. It's as a means of discovery uh, only. You have to be the one to change the facets of that search to say, I want only scholarly peer-reviewed material or material that has been scientifically vetted, or I only want to read things from newspapers that have received um, journalistic awards from the Associated Press. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. versus other newspapers that have a, a nefarious agenda. Um, you have to do those things in order to be, but that's that comes with evaluating information itself, which is again another difference between using Google and library search engines. Do you have with one of your role or responsibilities, say for example, that do you do you recommend access to a database to be in terms of your library system, for example, for students who say this, you know, studies political science? Mm -hmm. And they want to get specific data, have access directly to like the congressional budget um, sure. services that provide facts about policies that have been um, suggested, outcomes of the policy, and kind of track it. Not every library database have access to that. No, they so do don't. You, do you um, kind of advocate then for equal amount of information? equal access to information <laughs> and say, you know what? I believe our students would benefit from this. It should, yes. we should try to get into it, into that court consortium that you mentioned that, you know, kind of share the expenses of that. And even yeah. bring the community library in, in it, it as well. I'll, I'll pull it, I'll pull back the curtain and take it one step further. So the, the mm -hmm. current model uh, in America, uh, say in the United States mm -hmm. is again, we'll use us as an example. And we write this article. Now we're both 10, we're both tenure track faculty at our higher education library. And we are going to, we have to, as a result of that publish, it's called publish or perish. There's some imaginary number of articles that we mm -hmm. need to publish for in order for us to get tenure or else we're out of a job. Mm -hmm. We need to publish. So we're doing the work and sometimes, and, and we're working on this project together and we go to our library director or our Dean of libraries. And we say, you know, we, we applied for a grant to get funding um, from taxpayers to do this research and we need time off. We need research release time to go out and actually write. Mm -hmm. So we're getting time off from work and we're getting money from taxpayers to perform this research. Mm -hmm. What then happens is once we write that article and we go to have it published, we sign a piece of paper relinquishing our rights to that work and sign it over to the individual journal. The journal then owns that work. That journal then sells itself back to libraries at oftentimes a very high cost. Yeah. So we were paid by our institution and by the government, by taxpayers, to pro to get to provide research. That research is then taken by a publishing company and then sold back to libraries. Mm -hmm. That information, that research belongs to the public. We performed it. We took money from the public to do that. But this is the model that we see, and we're seeing a shift in that. So maybe we don't have access to some of those political science um, databases or journals for our constituents. Right. But what we're noticing now is more libraries and more higher education institutions who are advocating for what's called open access, meaning that they are paying or the institution is paying a, an additional fee to make that research available to anyone who searches for it, mm -hmm. regardless of whether or not you're connected to, you're logged into a library account at your public library or a current constituent of a higher education institution. And that's the trend that I would like to continue to see. But I, I mean, is it attainable in the sense of? It is, it's attainable by by consortia and by it's attainable from in higher education institutions that have the money to do so. At smaller institutions or institutions that are struggling, it's not really a viable model mm -hmm. for because it does cost extra money. And it's not, you know, it's not a $50 fee. It's it could sometimes be $500 to $1,500 to make that article open access. Mm -hmm. And if you have 30 publications a year, you know, that you're, 
you're looking at thirty thousand dollars spent to make articles open access that that money may not be available for smaller it's probably not available for smaller institutions so here here's a a, a question the librarian the need for a librarian the use of a librarian mm -hmm. we know that your institution is using it but for the consumer coming in the fact you know what are you seeing where students are actually uh, transferring their skills using technology? They are on TikTok. They can search for anything using their, their cell phone. But by the time they enter the library, they're like, I, I don't know how to search for this. Yeah. Yeah. Because does their that searches make, are different. Does, does that make the library now, the librarian, still as important and still as significant despite the change in technology? It's even more important, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I, so when, again, so TikTok or Instagram, you're using, you're getting information from these sites um, as a discovery tool. So maybe you learn about something through TikTok and you want to learn more about it. Well, that algorithm that you're searching in is designed to keep you engaged and designed to feed you specific information. So there's all sorts of other things that you need to consider when you really want to learn about that topic. So if you're doing it through popular searches, you're getting confronted with things such as confirmation bias or um, a limited scope of a definition of an issue or a subject that you want to learn about. When you come to the library, either your public or higher education library, you have the opportunity to look for vetted information about that topic. It's not going to say it's it's easy because a lot of the scholarly, most scholarly sources that you're interacting with are, are a different language, language that's used to remove bias, to give you nothing but what's supposed to be the facts so that you can make your own informed opinion mm -hmm. about a topic or a subject. Uh, that's where librarians shine, at least instruction out librarians like myself or discovery librarians like electronic resources librarians shine mm -hmm. because they're the ones that are putting that information to the forefront and helping users interpret them because the language is very different. You're not seeing language that's designed to make you feel a certain way. You're getting language that's that's displaying or presenting information very matter of factly. And so you have to spend time trying to interpret it. You have to think. And that's the <laughs> that's the struggle that I'm seeing with not just students, you know, at my institution, but other institutions that I've worked at mm -hmm. and colleagues that work at all these and to tell me and public libraries. Some it's difficult to spend the extra time looking at and searching for this material when we live in a society that expects our young people to really juggle eight different things at once mm -hmm. and have an instant kind of answer to everything. Okay. You need to think critically about topics. And 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 that that's the part that's missing the critical thinking aspect, especially sure. if if Google is just yielding a results that make it easily digestible and keeping you um sure. keeping you that way all right let's look at the physical space of the library and i don't know if instructional librarians have anything to do with that i mean do you go with the themes of the year you know autumn then you start putting up little leaves uh christmas you still do all of that there's there's still you know that's a community building thing too you celebrate the change of seasons with different books different displays, things like the academic libraries do that as well. Uh, if you're talking about physical spaces or spaces delegated towards physical materials, that is definitely shrinking, uh, at, at least in, in higher education. Where is it going? Online. So there are, again, physical books are never going to go away. They're just not. And, and so for me personally, when I when I finished my second master's, I loved ebooks because I can highlight in them. I can take notes. If somebody else checked it out and they returned it, and then I looked at my that book again, all of my information is saved. All that highlighting is still saved. Okay. Fantastic. 
if I'm going on vacation and I'm going to the beach, I'm not bringing my $200 e-reader to sit in the sun and sand. You know, I want a tangible item. Right. There's still a connection there. That's not going to go away. The physical books aren't going to go away, but there is a large preference to have material online. And you get and you get that accessibility, but what you lose is a little bit of discoverability. Mm -hmm. Meaning that you could go to a bookshelf and say you are into mysteries and you can you like this one author and you go to the shelf and you see what they have. But then you see what else the library has mm -hmm. in the mystery section. Right. You kind of lose that romanticism about finding something tangible that you can only find if you're there in the moment. Especially when you're searching for them online, it's a little bit more difficult. You're looking for that information and you get out. Especially for, um, say, the different generations, those who are accustomed to checking out the book and having it mm -hmm. in their hand and use their bookmarker, that type of thing, it could be frustrating for those individuals. I know you're at the college, um, you know, in, um, area where your library. We don't know if you know there's the non-traditional students that are coming in and expecting to, you know, check out a book versus you say, okay, here it is, go online, read it. You know, you have access to it this kind of way. Yeah. If you find any kind of frustration that way. Some will still want a physical item and we can, we can get that. Um, usually the problems arise through access. I don't know how to get into this ebook. I don't know how to save it. I don't know how to download portions of it. Mm -hmm. Um, those are teachable things. Those are things that, you know, librarians and library staff can teach you how to do. You reach more people with electronic access. So when you're know, hearkening back to your, your previous, you know, are there DVDs still in the library? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, DVD players still exist. I, I mean, my PlayStation will play DVDs. Um, you know, everything now is so subscription based and we saw this coming, but we're seeing, you know, at first it was just Netflix. Now it's Netflix and Disney and Showtime and HBO. All of these individual people are pulling on or corporations are pulling their material in favor of creating their own streaming service. Exactly. And we can't afford it. No one can afford to subscribe to mm -hmm. Hulu, Netflix, Disney, all these things just to get the one show or whatever they want. Right. But if you buy the DVDs and you have them, there are people that are still watching them. And if you're a really big film lover uh, and you have the DVD, you get extra things on them that you may not get on a subscription service, such as director commentary, um, outtakes, things like that, uh, different perspectives that are included on a DVD, but sometimes not streaming. And also that's, that, that movie that you love on Netflix can right. leave at any time. Well, that too. <laughs> so if you were being told, you know, I need to watch this specific show and it's on Netflix and oh, it's it, I'm halfway through it and it's gone. You got to wait for it to come back or you can, you know, see if your library has it. Good. So, you know, I notice in some libraries that they're um, putting in um, coffee um, tables and little treats. And I remember one time there's a sign you cannot enter the library with food. Get out, you right. know, you have to stay outside, leave it out there, or finish it and throw it in the garbage. Yeah, you cannot enter with the food. So the the physical space is changing, and so my question is, you know, I I think of it like a um, a Starbucks. Starbucks have its marketing strategy as a third place. You know, they're the third place, you know, it's um, work, what is it, home, work, or, or Starbucks, something like that. And, you, you know, people hang out there, they do their research there, they have conversations, they have business meetings there. Yeah. Why can't the library take on that? Um, they do. I we have, a pa we have two patrons who are adults. Uh, we're open to the public, a higher institution, but we're open to the public. Mm -hmm. uh, most higher institutions are, by the way, um, will be very will be open to the public, especially if they're a federal depository. They have to be open to the public. So let let, let me put it this way: We're, I I know I'm talking about physical space, but it is a mm -hmm. P. Is it a what? P? Yes, the physical space. Yeah, 
you know, if you look at some of the library spaces, it is, it is, it is not as updated and, you know, really even the, are comfortable to, to actually uh, uh, be, you know, sit in. And, and yes, some of them are offering coffee now and you can actually bring a, um, your coffee in and sit and read a book and things like that. So those those types of the, that that has definitely changed and been mm -hmm. lax. So if we're talking about food and drink policies, mm -hmm. they exist for a reason. So, um, you know, if you have a drink, we want something that's going to have a cover on it. Right. So it doesn't spill if you're using a public computer and then spill on the computer and then damage it. And now we're out of computer. Or, uh, you know, it's specifically designed for that. Mm -hmm. You, most libraries, I can't speak toward, you know, public. I, I'm, we, we got rid of those food policies years ago. Okay. With limitation. So, like, if you're going to have a pizza, a sandwich or something, bring it on in. Especially during finals week, the place would just be packed with pizza, and which is totally fine. Um, if you're going to order, you know, a four course Italian dinner and you're not going to bring any for me and I'm working late, I'm going to be <laughs> upset about it, you know, but we've looked past and the same thing with like shushing or, you know, libraries right. aren't that anymore. They, there are areas for that where you can have group discussions and conversations with are so important for, for communities to have. It's a safe place to do that. Mm -hmm. And then you have quiet areas and you do have people who either work for themselves or work remotely and or and they have children and they have an important meeting and they need quiet. They have libraries to go to. We have a few people who will spend eight hours here every day looking for spaces to, to work oh. at their jobs in the library because we have the Wi-Fi for available for free when we have a quiet area for them to mm -hmm. accomplish things. Mm -hmm. All right. I believe it was Newark Public Library, for example, that's one, and I'm sure there are others, implemented this uh, thing where they created, they employed a social worker mm -hmm. at their library um, to coordinate homeless services. Sure. How does that make sense to you? It's a, it's a public library. Well, there's a... a there's a library kind of <laughs> saying with, with public libraries, you have public problems. So if the library is open to everybody. And if the community that you're servicing is having issues with drug addiction or homelessness or houselessness, you're going, those issues are going to spill over into your public places. Having someone like a social worker there is going to help you navigate those persons and those experiences to help the individual that needs the help, mm -hmm. along with the library uh, in providing those services. Because they're part of the community, you know, whether or not you want them there or not. And it's not to say that sometimes it can be disruptive, mm -hmm. but those are community issues. They're not library issues. They have to be solved at the community level. Right. So having social workers there to direct people uh, in instances where librarians may not know what to do. I'm a librarian. I'm not a social worker. I can look up an organization and, you know, call them or or direct them to it. I, I don't know if they're going to go. I don't know if someone's going to come. Mm -hmm. uh, an example, a friend of mine at his library had a student or a young person refused to leave the library because they were afraid to go home yeah. because they identified as uh, on the LGBTQIA plus spectrum and they came out to their parents and their father was ready to disown them and make their home not a safe space. They, they couldn't. So what as a life, like if I had like what, who, who am I calling in that moment? You know? Yeah. So having a social worker there who knows the system, knows the available resources and you see those kinds of 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 things being um, advocated for for policing also. You know, how many times do police call for a domestic violence incident where if you had a social worker right along, they could directly help those individuals who needed that help in that point of need in that moment. So, so it's more about servicing the community than than 
creating yeah. so problems. I understand yes and and it, it's the services is needed and it's it, it's appreciated so I'm looking at it further though um would this be something that a, a, a social model then that should be captured and used um in no, you know now that our society is evolving so much and library is a safe space and then kind of you know implement within library system not so much um even though there's there's homeless students on on college campuses as well wow. but we know we know that the college have different services for them but say for the community where we know that some homeless people they show up at the library eight o'clock in hoping and then they leave you know they, 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 they that's where yep. they stay so yeah. should this be a model across many community libraries just in case um, to, to make sure that the library, you know, also parts of its relevance to the community? Yes, they should be working together. I'm an evidence-based person. So if you identify those needs or those challenges that a community is, is experiencing, then provide more outlets to mitigate those negative experiences and they give people the help they need. And that's not exclusive to public libraries. At my last institution, uh, my current one, I'm sure any other institution I've go to, their mental health is a real, real challenge in today's society. There's a lot of students, a lot of adult students also struggling with mental you know, health issues that we could be outlets to assist people with, or at least guide them to the to a to a place where they can get the help. Especially during times like midterms or finals week, and students, I, I have students who will break down, yeah, and then they'll start telling me their entire life story, and I'm like, I, I don't know what to say to you. Yeah, so I, I, some people deal with the same I'm thing. I do, everyone deals with something, and I'm like. <laughs> I'm a librarian, right? Yeah, I'm not a therapist. I can't, you know, I, I, you need to know how to get people help. And library, and they're coming to libraries as safe spaces, as a place to decompress or mm -hmm. express themselves in different ways. And then they have to go home. And sometimes, you know, that's not the place they want to be. So you, they struggle with that and you need to have resources available to really get people the help that they need, or at least feel safe in those experience, in those places where that aren't the library. So Nicholas, we're on our last three minutes or so of this. It's very interesting. I appreciate the information. So I have one last, quest last question for you as it relates to, I think you use a word vet material or vet information or something mm -hmm. of the sort. Um, with the technology um, as it increases, have you find where material may come in to the library, become part of your database or even through those other consortia, and you find that, that wait a minute, it's fake, yep. it's fake information, it's plagiarism, it's not what wasn't vetted properly, it's part of our system, oh my God, we may have exposed students to this information and material. How often does this happen, if it ever happened, and what often. do you do? Often. Um, wow. Often. Um, so we, libraries, librarians have, to, it's, not, it's not an easy task to keep track of. Yeah. So we have at the individual item level. So again, we're buying packages of materials because it's cheaper to do so. Um, I, the, so in terms of what you're saying, the most famous example that I can think of is an article published in The Lancet in the early 2000s, which is a peer-reviewed scholarly journal, and it made it through, and the article stated that vaccines cause autism. And the lasting effects of that have been taking place over the past 20 years. Yeah. The researchers were since debunked and the article was removed and there whatever punishments that they have for that they have to deal with but the, yeah that you you see packages of ebooks i there was one recently i don't want to say any names because i'm not sure which one it, i don't remember which one it was but it was at least three or four years ago 
where here's a package of ebooks for libraries that'll cost you a thousand dollars and you have twenty thousand titles of ebooks in there. I don't, yeah. Whatever, making the number up. Well, when we looked, some librarians looked at the title list and they looked them up and they found things like um, Holocaust denial books in there or um, books that referred to developmentally challenged people in, in outdated terms that are, you know, not. So those types of things don't belong. <laughs> Uh, in, in any kind of, as a discoverable um, things within libraries, it, whether or not people want to read them, go for it. But I, I can't, as a librarian, um, say this information is valid and continue to let people have access to it. So does a library then, uh, I mean, practices inclusivity, diversity, in terms of diversity, in, in Absolutely. other words? Um, you want to, you, you, you know, let me give an example. You want information about, um, writings of Malcolm X in your library. You want information about, um, controversial figures that may not necessarily sit within the institution. Do you have fight over that where they will say, no, our philosophy and our mission and our funders within say the college institution this would not sit well with them, so we cannot um, have students accessing this information because it must it could be politically based because of the institution, you know, who th their biggest funders are. Do you have that challenge? I have not had seen that challenge personally. But I have not. I have heard of it before. Uh, specifically, well, if we're going to bring it up current, currently, that you may have, um, and I haven't seen this at the library level either. Mm -hmm. But you, some some institutions where you will see, well, if you're going to have students agree with Palestine over Israel, right. we want to remove this kind of information so that we can skew the narrative. Libraries will stand up to that. Um, in terms of actual collections, it's you're always looking libraries now and especially in the past six, seven years are now including diversity, equity and inclusion statements within their collections development policies. So they're specifically telling you that the materials that they're collecting are not going to be from one point of view. Mm -hmm. You are going to have different points of view so that you can have educational discourse surrounding a topic. Mm -hmm. And that includes bringing marginalized voices into the discussion. And that's a huge part of education in general. We're not just opening a textbook and reading, and this is what happened. And this is how right. we learn about something. Right. Um, so if I were a, if I am in a biology class and I'm, I'm white and I'm in a biology class, and the teacher asked me, what is biology? Or uh, what is what is life? I, I would say, all right, it's a collection of cells that form an organism that need food, shelter, whatever. And you asked the same, you asked another student who was, let's say, what the same question who was, say, Native American. Mm -hmm. And you asked them, what is life? You know, and they they are going to have a different answer based on their experiences. They might say, I don't know. They might say life is something that needs to be respected and the environment. They, they have different experiences mm -hmm. surrounding topics. Yeah. People have different experiences surrounding topics that influence how they learn and express themselves and see value in the world. Those are the things that you have to bring into conversation because the world is not cookie cutter. It, it, we're a collective society with different experiences that lend to educational development mm -hmm. how we see the world how we interpret it so i know so you said something so i wanted to say. so well, I, I think it was in 2010 the texas board of education um they come they have a group of educators that come together they're the ones they take mm -hmm. educators from california florida texas because those are the three largest school um mm -hmm. the three largest school districts 
and they come together and they're usually the one decided on what is published within textbooks to educate Correct. the uh, K to 12 population. Mm -hmm. And they decide to remove um, George Washington and um, and replace, and then even included Cal, um, John Calvin, though, you know, because of the philosophy and meaning. Are librarians aware of these things? That, uh, librarians are aware of it. School that, districts that, that are aware of it. That they are manipulating, there are groups of people mani ma manipulating the history of and determine who should be placed in textbooks. Um, mm -hmm. I sent you a link to a New York Times article that will highlight the differences of those textbooks. Okay. So the textbook, the same exact textbook being used in, in Texas is different from the textbook that's being used in New York the, because of curriculum issues um, huh. or differences in curriculum. Mm -hmm. But that's certainly a problem if you're not exposing people to the full story or you're you're skewing the narrative of history exactly so you are going to have students growing up and being educated now and i wouldn't say incorrectly but only seeing a limited point of view or understanding a topic and only through a certain lens which again leads to confirmation bias uh, i don't I, I don't know how to fix that outside of making something uniform Mm -hmm. but that that's not how our society works okay. um there are stipulations attached so uh, we're, we see other things so we see open educational resources so instead of using textbooks there are alternate methods to teach that are available to everyone and that information is reviewed and oftentimes created by professionals working in higher ed. Uh, I don't know if that's a solution to that problem, but it, it begins collectively as a society in terms of education and, and, and saying, what do we agree on? Mm -hmm. you know, are we supposed to create critical thinkers and give them the full story and let them <laughs> evaluate so. it and come to their own conclusions, you know, which would promote a more healthy democracy or are we just going to indoctrinate people and say this is how it was and some people could say well depending on where your library is there could be some indoctrination taking place right because there are certain books that are being um taken off a shelf that yeah are being offered. i mean you'd be surprised i heard somebody said that even the to kill a mockingbird mm -hmm. is, is, is some libraries do not offer that story about um and, and i think this is a story within a book and i and um, you may know it the yellow wallpaper mm -hmm. i don't sure. know i think it's a story within a book yeah um, well it's it's like a yeah it's a kind of a short story yeah right. i mean i would say you know, they can't find it in the library because it's hedging on feminist themes and all mm -hmm. these types of things or racism themes that may not necessarily fit the um the constituents in which the library is located and so on. So it, mm -hmm. I, I'm realizing then, Nicholas, that the library is not, a, is not as dry. <laughs> no, it's not. And there's certain there's things so, that play into that. Yeah, so you... many different facets of it that actually can make or break a community. And, you know, as you said, inform them and allow them or actually indoctr indoctrinate them. If I wouldn't say from a library standpoint, it's indoctrination because you can still get that material. You can request it through okay. interlibrary yes. loan and get that from a different library. But if you're talking about how budgets are allocated to spend and buy material, um, if I live in, if I work for a library that is in a wealthy suburb where people are going on six or seven vacations a year, then I'm going to buy a material for that library that talks about travel and things like that. I'm not necessarily buying material that's going to talk about how to repair your, your car. Oh, I but see. But I can get that material from another library and another library can get those travel materials from me, from my library. So and it's not you, customized. You address it that way. 
That, it's that's not. Funny. No, you you think of them as global or a, a, as like a spider web of of a network of libraries. It's mm -hmm. not just about a singular library anymore. Outside of programming and things like that, you can get this material through your library. You're not going to be shut out from getting, you know, the yellow wallpaper. <laughs> I have an extra copy of it too, if you want to borrow. <laughs> Well, Nicholas Ferrelli, this has been, I, I really do enjoy this. I, I learned a lot um, from it. Uh, it's not a dry conversation. It's a lot of um, very juicy, tasty details. Here. Oh, there's so much more. Yeah. <laughs> and there's so much more. What, what I mean, I've, I think I've asked you as much as I could. What do you think that, well, she's didn't, she, she hasn't asked me this. What could it be, that question that I could, you know, should have asked, but I did not ask that maybe is as relevant to this Oof. conversation? I, I don't, I don't know. Um, I only came in through it one ended. It's like a job interview now. <laughs> um, do you need a librarian? Um, <laughs> um, I don't know. Offhand. When was the last time you visited your library? No, oh, we were there the other don't day. Don't <laughs> say it was the one that we were on the other day. <laughs> I would encourage you to reach out and do, uh, you know, the, 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 the the stay in school initiative it was a lot of fun working with you i would continue doing those things and offering yeah. those outlets to the public okay use your library you know you visit them see what's going on there are places for you to go to meet people to talk to people mm -hmm. uh, there are places to discover things movies uh, so, uh music art Mm -hmm. Not just books, they're outlets for that. It's mm -hmm. one of the last institutions that you can go to and not be expected to buy anything. Exactly. Sometimes they do give you things. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, free coffee and all that stuff. Is there. Yeah, sometimes you get it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, thank and we you take so them too. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, uh, um, Nick. And yes, I may reach out to you for another um, pronouncer um, with the adults. Stay in touch, please. <laughs> I had a lot of fun. Thank you so much for this information. And I You're hope you're very welcome anytime. To others. Take care. Thanks. Take care.